the rooms that you're in. How's that? Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So we're going live um, in like 10 seconds, I believe. Yes, we're live. Afternoon. Oh, we'll just admit everybody else. Hi, everybody. See people logging in. Ooh. Who's that lovely girl who just stepped in? Great. Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody that is tuned in to our uh, conversation. Welcome to everybody on the continent and from abroad who and, and everybody who's on our Zoom as well. Uh, thank you so much for being here for the first of two KITF events. Um, my name is Kirshma Bagani. I'm the Associate Artistic Director of the Tebere Arts Foundation. I'm very, very excited to be introducing uh, the first event that we have today, um, which is a conversation with two of our partners, uh, the Nairobi Musical Theatre Initiative and the Pan-African Creatives Exchange. Um, for those that are still coming in into our Zoom room, our kind request for you to please turn off your videos and also mute your audio, just so that we can have the most seamless uh, live streaming experience. Um, and for everybody else, thank you for uh, tuning on from Facebook and all of our other live streaming platforms. Um, without further ado, I will pass it on to our moderator, Rosette, today, who will lead us through our conversation. Uh, but before I can uh, officially do that, I just wanted to mention that we are having another event tomorrow where we will be looking at KIT uh, of course, because of Corona, we could not convene in person this year, unfortunately, but we're hoping that all those that are tuned in will be able to relish the nostalgia of our six in-person convenings that we've had ever since 2014 with a special documentary that we have compiled with all of the productions and works in progress and, and events and activities that we have had at the festival in the past. Uh, that will be released live on our YouTube channel at 2 p.m. tomorrow. So if you're able to log in and watch it at your own time, that would be wonderful. And of course, uh, you are also welcome to attend our cocktail hour tomorrow to network with uh, producers, artists that were present in previous years, and just to get to know more about uh, KITF as a platform. And that again, as I said, that video will be available for you to watch from 2 p.m. tomorrow. So thank you so much to all of our funders and our donors and to all of our partners, including the Pan-African Creative Exchange and the Nairobi Musical Theatre Initiative, uh, both of whom will be in conversation uh, with us today. Over to you, Rosette. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this conversation that is a part of Kampala Theatre Festival, as Karishma has mentioned. This is one of our online activities and it's our first online activity that we're creating. We at KTIF, Tebere and Tebere Arts Foundation are very excited to be partnering with the Nairobi Musical Theater Initiative in Kampal in Kenya and the Pan-African Creative Exchange in South Africa to produce this specific event this afternoon morning or evening depending on where you are in this world we are going to be talking about creative and disruptive platforms across the african continents and who better than to speak about these topics than four amazing artists art managers and academicians who are doing incredible works in their arts on the continent before i officially introduce our panelists please allow me to introduce myself and also give you a brief, brief history of the Kampala International Theatre Festival. My name is Rosette Interfas. I'm a festival and arts manager who is based in Kampala, Uganda. I work with the Tebere Arts Foundation and I've worked with KTIF since, it's organized, or since it started in 2014. And I'm very honored to be moderating this conversation. 
I will give you a brief history of uh, the Kampala Theatre Festival. This year's edition is the seventh edition, and we have had six festivals once each, uh, once every end of year in the month of November. The festival started in 2014 and was born out of the works that Sundan Theatre Program was doing in East Africa. That work evolved into an initiative called the Sundowns Institute East Africa. Um, that work that the Institute was doing, the work that the Institute was doing was to support East, six East African countries, which include Burundi, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, and Tanzania. They supported them by giving them space to help them work on their projects without feeling any kind of pressure to produce their work. Uh, the artists were able to produce work and without any pressure and write, create work, and the next phase led to being able to um, have a production. There was never really any space in between that uh, these artists could get support from their, away from their daily life, from the hustle and bustle of their cities that they lived in and make time to work on their works with the support of actors, drama actors, directors and creative advisors. So that was the gap that the Sundance Institute filled by inviting the artists from mainly Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and, and eventually Rwanda to go to Utah for their theater summer labs to see whether the theater makers in the US could resonate with our artists in the region. So when Sundance Institute was transiting into the Middle East, the questions that were on the table well, how would we be able to maintain the, the kind of work that Sundance is doing? And how would we be, well, how would we ensure that this work is actually sustained by East Africans themselves? So this is how Bayimba came on board because of the kind of festivals they were running and producing. So Bayimba, Terera and Sundance Institute partnered to produce a festival that was specifically a home for Ugandan theaters, as well as East African theaters, and was a platform and is still a platform for works to, to be seen. So that is how the theater festival was born. Um, so what we've been doing over the years is focusing on East African works and African works, but also inviting works elsewhere so that our the theater practitioners and makers can interact with their contemporaries from elsewhere and our audience can get exposed to the different ways of making theater. We have had performances from different parts of the world, but always making sure that African works are highly represented at our festivals. Over the years, what has become apparent to us is to keep spaces for these African works from different parts of the region so that it's not only limited to East Africa, but we have a representation from South, um, Southern Africa, West Africa, North Africa. Though we have not yet uh, had a representation from North Africa, but we have invited them. It's just because they have not been able to make it to our, our festival. It's our hope and ambition to make this a very significant festival and platform for the continent as far as theater is concerned. The two things that we're thinking deeply about right now is how to involve corporate local sponsorship and make sure we captivate an audience that is Ugandan. On that note, I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, before I introduce the panelists, I kindly request that everyone switches off their videos and mutes their mics so that the discussion can go smoothly. I will introduce, I'll start by introducing Eric Wainaina. Um, I will give a brief introduction of the panelists and Karishma will share their full biography in the chat. So you can be able to look at the chat, uh, chat room and see their full biographies. I'll start by introducing Eric Wainaina. Eric Wainaina is a well-known musician, artist, actor, artist activist in Kenya, Africa, and worldwide. He is a graduate of Berkeley College of 
Music and is an artist director of The Rainmaker, producer and production and the Nairobi Musical Theater Initiative, which he runs in concert with his wife, managing director, Sheba Heist. In, two, in 2004, Eric set a milestone on the Kenyan music scene where when he premiered a 21 song music theater piece, Wonder, Man of Stone, based on a local folk story marrying the traditional instrument and styles of Luo people of Western Kenya with contemporary urban sound. Eric Wanaina is an alumnus of the Theater Institute program, East Africa Initiative. Welcome, Eric. I will go over to Sheba. Sheba is the co-owner co and managing director of Rainmakers Production. She's long, she is a long arts producer in Kenya and now serves as the director of Nairobi Film Festival. She has also directed and produced the Sawa Sawa Festival to celebrate Kenyan performing arts. From 2005 to 2008, she was a director of Sarakathi Trust and dedicated to, to, dedicated to the study and performance of acrobat, performance of acrobat arts. Welcome on board, Sheba. Next, I will introduce Erwin Mars. Erwin is a New York, New York based theater maker, education, education, edu educational and ed international arts advocate from the Netherlands. He has worked extensively in Australia, Europe, South Africa, South Korea, and US. In, the, in New York, he directs several productions of Broadway as well as site specific. Maz is a co-founder and director of Pan-African Creative Exchange, artistic associate and director for the fellowship program for the International Performing Arts for the Youth and the program director for Off-Broad Origin Theater Company. He has been frequently invited as a director, facilitator, educator, and speaker for international and cultural festivals and universities and congresses and think tanks. For more of his biography, we have shared it online through the chat. Welcome, Ewin. Last but not least, I will introduce Nick Jonah. Nick Jonah has very various roles in the cultural sector. She is currently a visiting research fellow at the, the Center School of Speech and Drama. She is the lead for the pop culture and social exchange at Count Points Art. In 2008, she launched the Pan Africa Creative Exchange Pace, a platform for artists based in Africa. Welcome, Nick, on board. Uh, right now, I will dive into the questions and I would, uh, I'm going to read out the questions and I will direct the first questions to. Eric and Sheba. The questions are, could, could you talk about the platform that you lead and maybe the other platforms that you are aware of on the continent that are transforming creative experiences and how they are doing that? What is their impact and what has been the impact in COVID-19 era? Eric, do you want to start or shall I? You go ahead and start. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on this morning or afternoon or evening, as we've now learned to, to do our salutations in different time zones. Um, but it's great to be on this conversation with um, all of you who are here in this room and those of you following on Facebook as well. Um, as Rosetta said, I am sitting in Nairobi, Kenya, where I currently, in my capacity as like the managing uh, director of the of the NBO Musical Theatre um, Initiative, um, but I've, which I think is perhaps 
the place that I'd like to sort of start talking about the work that we do that we think is disruptive and interesting, at least in this space. Um, I probably should have let Eric tell a little bit about the actual starting of the initiative, of uh, the Musical Theatre Initiative, because he was right there at the inception of the project, and I'll let him talk about that part. But what we have going on right now is an initiative that basically has um, collaborative teams of composers and um, writers who have come together for the last uh, four years to create new musical works um, that are based on East African and Kenyan stories predominantly. And the objective of this was to create a new body of work that could be enjoyed by um, audiences in Kenya who had demonstrated a real um, and committed appetite for music theater. But we were, we were feeling that we were constantly living in material that had been initiated and written in other contexts and other countries and we're constantly working in an, in an adaptation sort of framework. And it seemed interesting to, to, to ground the storytelling from Kenya and from our lived experiences and from our traditional stories um, melded with our contemporary experiences as well and develop works that could form an interesting body of work, not just for our audiences here at home, but also for audiences um, outside of, of Kenya and East Africa. Um, the program has been running for, as I said, four years now, and we've got 14 um, productions that are in development um, at different stages of development. And it has had an interesting effect because uh, I think we landed on a kind of unusual model uh, in terms of in terms of writing programs, because most of the writers who are coming into our program and most of the composers, neither one nor the other had ever considered themselves writers of musical theater work per se. In fact, the whole category strikes a lot of people as being a perhaps uniquely West Endy, um, New Yorky type of thing. And that doesn't have a very uh, deep rooting in, in, our, in, in our part of the world. I think that some of the incredible discoveries, though, that have been found by taking the risk to explore genres that are outside of your comfort zone and seek to see whether you can um, relocate some of, like, um, I take on the risk of trying to create this kind of material has allowed some really interesting challenges to even what the form of musical theater traditionally looks like in the rest of the world. And I'm very excited to be part of this particular effort that is perhaps um, providing an Africa rooted response to what um, the genre could look like um, from our point of view and redefining those parameters somewhat and giving them a more uh, a more a broader read basically one that allows um, our methods of storytelling and our methods of um, incorporation of music into our storytelling into into this genre um, it seems very much in keeping with the re-centering of creative work that's going on across the world and notably led by the Black Lives Movement um, uh, initiative uh, um, movement in, in, in America. I mean, I think we're also going through a process in East Africa where we're really beginning to, well, continuing continuing to, I think we've always been in a, in a strong resistance activism space about um, creating work that speaks to the truth, but being able to do it also through the creation process and through the content of the work that we're creating. So that's what we're doing here with the NBO Musical uh, Theater Festival. Um, as far as like um, other bodies uh, that work ar around the continent, I suppose, I think one of the most useful things about this particular initiative and this particular collective for me comes from the point of view of the fact that I, I, I hadn't really considered working as a, as a creative in Kenya, I hadn't really considered that there could be a very strong context for the work that we were putting together here um, in, um, in other African countries and in other African markets, partly because there were so there's so many barriers, as we all know, and it's kind of like, you know, preaching to the choir, telling a story that we already know, that it is, it is, it is, it is difficult to imagine knowing all the challenges that there are in, to production in this context and imagining those same challenges to production to exist in a real way in Tanzania and Uganda and maybe in Lagos. Um, the challenges of like, wanting that work to travel, that the desire of wanting that work to travel is often met by a resistance of kind of 
uh, uh, maybe uh, I don't want to call uh, uh, an anxiety about the difficulties and the barriers there are to that work being able. So I think we limit ourselves in like actually seeking those opportunities and looking for those pathways and get sort of attached to what seem like more straightforward pathways, you know, going northwards and north uh, northwestwards where there are more established markets with and much more easier paths to market. Um, but I think one of the most interesting things about taking play, uh, participating as I did in the, in the PACE um, process, which you will hear about um, I, uh, shortly from Nikkei and Erwin, was really the opening up to um, the realization of how many um, uh, organizations with a very similar um, ethos to our organization exist and with a, and, and connecting with this um, other organizations that could have great synergies with ours. Um, I also experienced it traveling to the Kampala festival. Uh, an initial, I mean, Kampala is right next door to us. It literally is a bus ride away, but um, it really took a deliberate invitation from Deborah Simwe to say, hey, why don't you bring these works in progress to our platform for us to really begin to put our minds around like, well, what is it, what would it take to produce um, in that context? And having traveled there and actually witnessed the, the, the wonderful Kampala Theatre Festival in progress, it's now an anchoring point along my path for where I want to see where work can begin to have a journey outside of, of Kenya for me and for like, you know, in the East African context, very exciting. Um, so I, I, I have to say for me, this is a very big season of learning and connecting with other platforms. And it's the, it is this um, COVID season that has actually um, amplified the, 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 the accessibility, the potential accessibility of these other platforms, but also awakened a more intentional desire to connect with those platforms. And yeah, and maybe I'll stop there for now. I think segueing directly from that, I think that uh, definitely um, this period, um, thanks Shiva for, for, for referencing it, um, COVID has done many things to the planet, but one of the things it has done is, I think it has brought us together in such interesting ways, um, connecting in ways that we had not previously thought were possible. Uh, a friend of mine once asked me, so uh, do, you, do, you, do you see that success for, for the work that you're doing necessarily um, involves playing on a stage in New York? And I was dumbfounded when they asked, um, because well, I, I think I, up until that point, maybe I had kind of thought, yeah, you know, things do kind of need to end up there. Uh, but uh, the sort of the, the interest with which they asked it was, look, I mean, um, what about the rest of the continent? What are you doing about that, you know? Um, and for me, uh, the, the, the works that we are creating uh, in the musical theater initiative are telling such homegrown and such heartfelt stories uh, uh, drawn from this particular context that if I was asked right now, where, where do I finally want to see those plays? Yes, it would be nice to see it on Broadway, but I'd love to see it playing in Nia May, or I'd love to see it playing somewhere in Banjul. You know, it's, it, would be, it would be great. Um, um, uh, one of the things that we're doing right now, and uh, one of our participants always talks about it, is that uh, in this process, we are discovering or have discovered our tribe, as it were. Um, the people who we need not explain to what it is that we do and we just get together in this space and, 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 uh, and, and write these works together. All the participants here uh, are people who are, who are professionals in their own right doing their own thing. Uh, but like Shiba said, they've never necessarily sat down to write a musical, but they bring in their particular strengths um, whether uh, if we're talking about a Sitawa Namwali who has been writing poetry and writing straight plays forever, um, or if you talk about, uh, we have a group called Too Early for Birds who are taking, um, who are uh, putting the untold uh, Kenyan histories on stage. So when you hear that, um, uh, a story about a political assassination, yes, but what is the, maybe, what if we, if we heard the story from the standpoint of the, of, of, of the wife of the assassin, for instance, you know, sort of stories that are, as it were, um, um, adjacent to, 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 to the main story that we haven't yet heard being told. 
Um, during this period, what we've been doing while we, it had been our plan to get everyone together for a residential workshop because of COVID that not being possible. And what has ended up happening is that we've had every work, um, well, eight of the, of the 14 works so far, um, come and spend a week um, uh, uh, here with us. Um, with, and, and we literally, the first thing, because the hardest part has been, how do people commit what they've written so far into some kind of permanent form? And so we've kind of been saying to everyone, the minute you walk in, then the metronome in the studio starts going off. So it's a, so as in like literally we're recording, right? Um, and so what that has meant for people is that it has forced people to say, okay, fine, okay, fine, right? I don't know where this is going, but let me put this down now. Um, and uh, there's been significant progress um, in, in, the, in the works that we've been, uh, that, that have been in development here, just sort of uh, forcing people to, or compelling people to make, to make that, um, that step of, uh, of permanence as it were. Um, yeah, I think um, I've said what I'm gonna say for now. Over to you, Rosette. Thank you, Eric and Shiba for sharing your experience and telling us what is happening in Nairobi. I will pass it over to Nick and Ewin to tell us about PACE and other platforms and what is happening on their side. Hi. Thank you, everybody, and um, thank you, um, Krishma, Shiva, and all in Kampala, Kenya, and the rest of the world for inviting us to be part of this platform, and also sharing your time with us over the last, uh, I think, maybe six or seven months we've been talking to them, so it's been thrilling for me because I don't have a strong connection in, in Kenya, but what I do have a strong connection in is South Africa and in um, West Africa. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the Pan-African Creative Exchange. And as um, Rosette said earlier, it was set up in 2018. And it really came off the back of the fact that a lot of activity that happens around the world in terms of buying work or collaborating but on a world scale tends to happen outside of the continent. And for a long time, a lot of, I used to run a very similar showcase platform in England as part of the Arts Council England initiative to support African, Asian and Caribbean artists. And so lots of um, delegates and practitioners, arts professionals from across the continent would say, when are you gonna come home? But my intention was always to do something in West Africa. It's my second home but actually South Africa was perfect in all, for all sorts of reasons. So we partnered with the Freistat Festival, the international festival, it's an Afrikaans vernacular festival that was really wanting to diversify what is seen as an Afrikaans festival. They wanted it to represent the Afrikaans speaker of South Africa, which is around, I think, 51% uh, people of color. So, we set up this platform really to do a couple of things. One, we wanted to be sure that we weren't replicating models from the West or Europe or North America or Australia that didn't quite work for marginalized groups or Africans and taking into um, consideration the context in which many people in Africa operate in. When I say that, I mean that, that funding infrastructures aren't there, I mean, that also theatre infrastructure. I mean, I think in, in Nigeria, we've only got a, a handful of theatres for a country of over 170 million. Um, we don't have the same. I mean, I think South Africa is quite, um, it, it is quite a strong and quite a well-developed theatre infrastructure. There's always room for growth, but they, they, they have quite strong theatre infrastructure when you look across the continent. So we put on this showcase and we invite people for within, within our network. So Erwin is based in New York. And he has a huge network of North American um, presenters, 
programmers, people who are interested in investing in artists and arts organizations that are based on the continent. Also because his doctor has very strong connections in Europe and um, in the Netherlands. I have quite a strong connection across Europe, US, Canada, West Africa, and Ricardo is connected in Australia, Asia, and of course, South Africa. So we've combined our networks and we encourage people who can buy or invest in some kind of way to come to PACE. So what is PACE? It's really a place where artists can meet other artists from across the continent and the wider diaspora, or artists who are also interested in responding to contemporary Africa. So you get artists from Spain and Australia, but the majority of the focus for PACE is for artists on the continent. And so they get to show work that is what we call tour ready. That is work that's ready to go that can be picked up by a festival or by a venue or can start a tour. And that is really for artists who are really 100% ready to go. The second category, which is a lot more of what we think a lot of the work fits in, is what we call tour ed and work in progress. And that is work that's gone through some kind of research and development phase, some kind of rehearsals, but still needs some kind of support. They might need funding support, or they might need creative support. They might need other artists or artistic directors to help steer them a little bit so that they can shape it for, to, for a piece of work that can travel beyond their local space. When we talk about travel, we don't mean outside of the continent, we mean within the continent, within your own country and the rest of the world. And then we've got pitching for people who might have the big idea or that can't really sit with a, um, a showcase platform because of physical feasibility. Um, and that allows them to share their work, their early ideas, um, and that does quite well. And we split pitching into two spaces. We have it set up as speed dating, which is a bit more of an intimate experience where you can just go around and meet people. And as you meet people, um, five or six people in, in a session, groups of people, you sharpen your pitch. And we did the speed dating this year, and we did the pace on completely online, and it went down incredibly well. And um, we're still getting a lot of really positive feedback, but the speed dating did actually quite well online. We also, within our platform, we also have a, a producer's lab, which is running right now until I think February um, next year. And we also do a dramaturgy lab. So we have a number of components because we recognize that as with any artist, um, there's always, a, you always have to have a space to develop and shape and sharpen your, your work, your thinking, your media, be able to feed into what your peers are doing. We also are very, very strong with dialogue. We really try to develop a dialogue um, in, in a lot of what I find is on, on the continent, there isn't a lot of discourse around non-text-based um, work. A lot of it's rooted within the playwright or the, the writers, the authors. So actually we need to start developing that and helping people find their sort of journey in that space. But I'll leave it for now because I'm sure Owen has a few more words to add. Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief because uh, you, you explained uh, the majority of it. Um, so, hi everybody. Uh, it's really lovely to be with you all uh, from uh, New York. That's why the lights are still on here. It's, uh, it's relatively early, so it's just getting uh, a little bit lighter. Um, but uh, yes, Nika is correct. Uh, I think the biggest difference what people want to understand is that the Pan-African Creative Exchange uh, it, the word kind of says it, it's an exchange. Uh, so it's not a festival uh, in, the, in, the, in the term of how people use, use uh, festival terms. Uh, it's really a platform for people to come, to connect, and for producers, presenters to see work that they normally don't get to see and then decide if they want to collaborate with that or want to buy it uh, to present in their own countries. <laughs> So uh, that's, I think, is the biggest uh, biggest term for uh, the showcase, what we're saying. It's real, we're really showcasing. 
And this started by a coalition of the willing uh, when we were coming together in South Africa in 2015. Uh, and the United Nations just came out with a report that said that of all the world creative output, selling, collaboration, uh, residencies, of all the world's output, 1% came from the African continent. And that's shocking, uh, particularly knowing how huge Africa is and how much creativity there is. But we also all know the reasons why, funding, uh, visas, the difficulties. And so that was kind of the start of, um, of leading to this platform of how can we change that. Um, and as Nikkei said, we, we do have these particular strands that people can write into. Uh, and how do you get to be part of that is that we actually have a selection committee that uh, we are quite proud of, uh, that consists of quite a lot of festival directors on the continent uh, from North Africa, the middle of Africa, East, West and South, as well as a few, the majority is on the continent, but we also have a few presenters and producers from outside uh, the continent to look at the work, at the work as well. Um, because some work would really represent very well in the continent, whereas other work represents better outside and vice versa or both. And I think it is that kind of context, that conversation that we're having in the four days when we come together. It's a, it's a biannual event, so it happens once every two years. Uh, uh, and we come together for four days uh, uh, with people from all over the world. And the conversations that are being had at that point is very much talking also about the context of the work. Uh, what does it mean if you are presented uh, your work is presented in Europe or in China or in Australia. Um, how do you want the people there, the communities there, to talk about your work or to see your work? And I think that's what a lot of people never really think about as artists. I'm a theater maker myself, and we tend to always focus on the work itself. But then when we want to tour with it or when we want to present it elsewhere, how do we want that work to be presented? And I think that's something that we talk a lot about as well at PACE. Uh, one of the things, I don't come from the continent myself, uh, and one of the things that I'm always really quite struck by is uh, how in many ways, uh, artists on the continent are at the forefront of, of things that are happening. Um, uh, so even, uh, sometimes it's by necessity, but, Artists on the continent always wear multiple hats, uh, probably because they need to. But uh, here uh, in America, for example, uh, that's kind of like a new news and not an, anymore that new, but for the last 20 years that people are saying like, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, this multidisciplinarity. Uh, that's something that I've been seeing in work on the continent for a long time. Uh, it's highly contemporary. And I think that's particularly something outside the continent that, that, that is not as known. People outside the continent are still looking at a certain way to Africa and the work coming from Africa, and that's what they want to represent. And this is something that PACE is very much trying to uh, go against. It's very much trying to show the contemporary work uh, that's being uh, created in the continent. That's, that's really exciting, and that needs to be seen elsewhere. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, uh, Rosetta, because I know that you have uh, some more questions, but that's, uh, that's kind of what Pace is really representing. Thank you, Ewen. Uh, I'll go to the second question and I'll pick from what you and Nick have mentioned. Uh, how effective is the way technology has played a role and how can we create and consume arts across the continent? And how can we utilize technology bearing in mind that in Africa, we have poor infrastructure and in some cases, most cases, high costs that are involved. Um, I was privileged to be part of uh, PACE this year. And I'm, I, I think the audience would be curious to know from Nick and Ewen um, why you chose to shift uh, your the exchange from physical to online and also your choice of using the online platforms to showcase 
the works and any advice in terms of technology that you'd give someone who is hosting an event or what to look out for. So I'll direct those questions to Eric, I mean to Nick and Erwin. Uh, yeah, I can I can start with it. I think uh, obviously the reason why we went to is very simple. It's why everybody is going online at the moment. It's because of the pandemic. We uh, were forced to go online. Um, uh, our event was supposed to happen in June uh, in South Africa. As Nikkei explained, we're connected to the Free State Arts Festival, which usually happens in June. Uh, and so that was the idea that we would be there. Uh, um, but then obviously we weren't able to, nobody could travel. So we were able in a very short amount of time uh, to switch it to an online platform. Uh, the great uh, plus with that has been that it created huge accessibility. Um, we, we had a lot of more people uh, joining us because they simply didn't have to fly uh, to places. Um, and so that was really a big plus. Um, negative, as you say, Rosette, uh, is that, of course, uh, not everybody has great uh, connection always. Um, and so we ran into some issues there using another platform besides Zoom called AirMeet, which is great. It's a great platform to, uh, to network with each other because you have much more freedom. Who do you speak to? In Zoom, you're kind of uh, stuck to the program that everybody else is in. Um, but that platform is relatively new and they were, for example, not able to uh, have users from mobile devices. And that's, of course, a big no-no <laughs> if, uh, if, if you do something like what we were doing, because a lot of people on the continent use Internet, have Internet access through mobile devices. So that uh, was a that big lesson learned uh, for us. Um, but fortunately, we were able to have all these um, sessions also on Zoom, so uh, that was a possibility for that as well. I, I think the majority or the biggest plus again is this accessibility. Uh, I feel that so many artists on the continent uh, felt that uh, it was an event that really put Africa front and center and that uh, made people connect with each other that you know, you might indeed be, as Shiba said before, you might be next door neighbors, but uh, somehow, even though you're close to each other, you might ne not necessarily collaborate. And then you come to an event like this, and then all of a sudden you meet people that might just be next door to you and you decide to collaborate. So that often happens if you kind of go outside of your own uh, realm, if you will, you meet people and you meet people from far away, but also people from very close. And then you start to collaborate and you start these conversations that were happening, which was really exciting. Uh, besides that, I would say is we're now so focused in the digital realm uh, on Zoom or on camera, on, on, on like these camera works. But let's not forget all the exciting things that are happening on WhatsApp or uh, via phones, you know, like Instagram, or uh, there's so many other things happening that doesn't necessarily require a camera or, uh, you know, like this live digital um, conference uh, platforms uh, that we saw at Pace as well. So there's a lot of exciting work happening uh, in the digital realm. Just to kind of add to um, what Owen said is, Ricardo Pichu is our other co-founder. He actually comes from a digital and experimental art background in Australia. So this was perfect for him because he could play a lot. He was really um, adventurous. Um, and so we actually did a call for telematic arts um, artists working in partnership with Paco Gacy and Ars Electronica and a couple of other platforms from around the world kind of give artists a chance to create work that is live and participatory in the in the digital space or over telephone or digital space. So this is really quite interesting, the work that's coming out. People are thinking about their own practice very differently. I think also what was great about um, AirMeet is they set up their platform to support the Global South. Because they're based in India, they said, look, we know that certain countries, people's internet service 
needs a particular kind of bandwidth to work on some of these platforms. So you can work on um, a, a lower bandwidth and still get the quality experience on any because they've been designed it to support users um, and give access to the global south beyond Zoom and other platforms. The other thing that we did is we, we supported people with data. So we recognize that we couldn't really pay people and we recognize that a lot of artists were quite precarious. They lost their jobs or no work was coming in. They were stuck indoors. So we thought, how can we address that in, in the ways that our funders are allowed? And all our funders were really flexible and allowed us to give people data. So all the artists based on the continent that work with us were given a data allowance, if you'd like, to be able to pay for their data, maybe even use it for other things. We just, and, and I thought that was great. And the other thing we did, because we were really keen to have um, Francophone Africa in the room, we supported some of the artists who were French speakers with people um, who were supporting translation. So they were translating, I don't know how they were doing it, if they, if they were on a phone call, but supporting artists who were, who were not comfortable in English to be able to navigate, um, navigate the online space and navigate the conversations. And we're actually looking to do a little bit more of that um, working with Koreans. The Koreans are really interested in partnering with us to have more access to artists on the continent. So yeah, um, watching this space, yeah. Yeah, if I can also add on that, because I think that might be a nice segue uh, to, to Eric and Sheba as well, is one of the things like what Nikkei was saying with regards to uh, commissioning artists, I think the digital space was very interesting for that as well, because um, if we have to fly in artists and put them in hotels and stuff like that, that of course is much higher costs. Now we were able to give artists uh, uh, small, relatively small, but still a fee purely for the work to create uh, uh, creative interventions. Or we had poets starting every day uh, doing a, a spoken word about uh, disruption and disobedience. And so we even, we collaborated with NBO MTI with two artists, uh, Alea and Sitawa, that did a fantastic creative intervention um, on one of the days uh, of, of, of um, Pace. And they were so successful that now other platforms that saw them at pace doing that were are now asking them to come into their digital online festival or online platform to do a similar event. And this is exactly what pace is about. It is really about like showcasing these artists and, uh, and then hopefully giving these opportunities for them to link to other platforms. And, uh, and I think, yeah, that's, that's what's been so exciting also in our collaboration with NBO MTI uh, is that both Eric was presenting his own work uh, at Pace, Sheba was part of the producer's lab, and, and like I said, we also were working with some of the artists uh, for the creative intervention. So that was really a nice collaboration between these two platforms, and we did similar things with the Lagos Fringe uh, and, and other platforms on the continent. Thank you, Nick and Ewen. A lot of people have been complaining and saying that uh, technology and online digital spaces are creating so much divide and some people see it as a disadvantage. But uh, for some people, it has created uh, uh, so many opportunities for you to be able to go across countries in your living room and to speak to people from different continents to learn from them. Uh, Sheba and Eric, uh, could you uh, give us experience, your experience with technology, especially with um, uh, musical initiatives that you are involved in? How have you been able to utilize technology and what advice would you give to someone who is, who is struggling to use it? Uh, that goes to Sheba and Eric. Okay, I, I guess I'll go first again. Um, the I think we were very challenged by because uh, by this whole um, incredible, um, practically an extinction event is what it feels like, as somebody described it to me. 
Um, and uh, of course, the, the urgency with which we were, well, the fact that we had to abandon all plans of having an in-person, we were supposed to be having really around this time of year, our first um, in-person um, festival of new works, which we had to abandon the plans to do, uh, which was very disappointing, but also presented a huge challenge to our our writers and uh, composers, because how were we going to give them a context in which to be able to experience their work completed and also to have a, a written goal to work towards again. Remember, we're working for the first time. Uh, we're working with people who are doing this for the very first time. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm actually gonna have to shut the, the door because my, my dog just opened the door. I'm so very sorry. Yes, we have a very, very special dog and has been visiting both rooms. And so maybe I'll take over from, I just, I'll just kind of jump in. Oh, Ashiba, you're back? Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, I should have just let you go. But anyway, we, we, we landed on the idea of um, the radical old idea of radio, um, because I think one of the things that we found has been so, um, challenging about just flipping over to uh, to these sort of visually based platforms is that, you know, the camera is part of the storytelling in a film and in a way that the eye is the, the storytelling um, uh, interpreter for a theater play. So as soon as you bring a camera into any situation of theater, you're already making editorial choices for the audience member. And, you know, you need to be good at that or, if you're not, you're going to be making, like, you know, you're going to be editing the experience heavily. However, and also you also need to be able to consider like what, what quality of production values are you going to be able to achieve? Um, just as we all know, like producing for television and film really puts things on a different um, um, scale. And I think one of the other things that we found um, challenging as we looked at people, as we all were negotiating the crossing of our in-person work into virtual and digital spaces, um, there really became a differentiation of like really the entertainment value of certain experiences versus others. As much as we all accepted initially, like wow, this is a great rallying together, there be, there be, you know we begin to discriminate between what kinds of content we're enjoying ex ex experiencing in this format and which kinds. We are not. What the audio format um, presented for us is that as studio owners ourselves, we, we pride ourselves on being able to produce world-class audio quality that, you know, is, 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 is well, you know, we couldn't get any better than how we can make it. Um, that we are able to still leave this incredible space for the imagination and for the individual audience member to, um, to interpret the work and to by, by allowing them to have their own visual accompanying experience. And we actually unlock that as something that, you know, looking now, you know, something that, yes, it's a kind of a throwback because radio theater for some reason disappeared from like Kenyan, um, the Kenyan radio scene with the, when the FM stations came online, it almost virtually um, disappeared. And yet it was something that we'd grown up with and had really enjoyed. And, um, it hasn't really come in, like, you know, the podcast culture is, is slowly on, a, on the rise, but that comes with a different kind of language, although it's virtually, it's, it's on demand ra talk radio, you know. Um, so we began to see the, the coming together of, of two worlds that we had previously not seen ourselves playing in and um, imagining our theater works for that space. And that's been a very satisfying journey to have, uh, to be embarking on and has given a sort of new life to our presenter, to our, our creators, because it presents a whole other kind of challenges. Yes, it allows them the opportunity to complete their storytelling from a musical and, and a story point of view to, it has to be to a satisfactory level, but they also get to um, develop a kind of a, a new skill and a new opportunity and, and explore a new medium um, and have then this other completely new creative um, area of expression that, um, that now presents all kinds of opportunities and stands for them as a pitching document 
for whatever it is that they want to do next with this work that they've created, whether they want it to go into, to, to become an animated series. And suddenly you can imagine sort of much more radically when you haven't already made all the creative decisions around, around the piece. So that's been really powerful uh, for us. And we've also, you know, stepped up and gotten into podcasting, things that you've always intended to do, but you've kind of, you know, now this, this was the moment when you, you start to take advantage of all these existing technological platforms that you haven't necessarily committed yourself to relearning. But I think if I want to talk about the challenging side, I think there's still a huge gap and we've experienced it also on the music industry side and on the theater side, which is really how do artists effectively monetize and um, how do they, uh, you know, how do they, how do they ticket this, and how do they monetize this? And beyond just having pure sponsorships and putting this out live, how do they build communities around this that really value and give you, you know, I mean, ticketing is a really, it's it's the final valuing of your work, right? If nobody wants to buy a ticket to your show, maybe, maybe you should, you know, think about how good that show is. You know, um, it's a very important assessment tool about whether your society really wants the work that you're making or not and it's a valuable one to put yourself um, to the test to regularly I think um, and um, but but uh, that is still a really complex uh, problem to unpack uh, for for most of us um, whether it's about free content sitting on platforms like YouTube and then being um, you know getting uh, royalties from the back end of that or whether it's, you know, we've seen people experimenting with tip jars, there's WhatsApp for business where you sign up to people's WhatsApp for business and you receive the content on a membership basis. I've seen people doing stuff with Pat Patreon. I don't know how to say that word. Is it Patreon or Patreon? And um, also becoming increasingly popular as ways of like, which are, those are subscription-based services. So you sign up and you get additional content. Um, and another one that, that people have been talking quite seriously about is um, uh, a network, uh, a platform called OnlyFans, which is popular with people who sell adult content. They figured out how to monetize this content a long time ago. Um, and maybe that there could be some, I mean, could there be some learning about how you put some pay gates in front of some of your work and still allow other work to be, uh, to, to, to be accessed at no cost? Of course, data um, always remains a, a limiting factor, maybe a little bit less so in Kenya because we seem to have good, relatively better data packages than the rest of in many other places. Um, but uh, yeah, it does continue to be one of the challenges to um, the, the, the magical story of you know, putting this content online. I'm I'm um, I'm just gonna say uh, uh, the the film as good as it gets. Jack Nicholson walks into this um, this 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 ward where he's he's going for, going in for counselling, and he looks at the rest of the patients, and he says, "Folks, what if this is is as good as it gets?" And so um, I know everyone's been talking about the new normal, but we've there's there's always been a thing. Okay, maybe maybe it's a vaccine, maybe it's gonna work, maybe it's not. Um, but I think that. Hey, we, we, we are in a place right now where we should stop. And I think a lot of us are doing this. Where we're not seeing ourselves as victims of the current situation anymore. Right? I'm, um, but where they're like, what can we do to embrace this thing and, 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 and power through it? Um, I think even um, technology, uh, the, the way people are making even videos now or whatever, as in like even on social media, we become so much more accepting of things that 10 years ago would have been they're like come on that's a multi-camera job for sure you know but now i just they're like oh yeah camera in the face that works right and i think we are we are we are embracing we are using technology as it is right now and forcing it to um to work with us in this in this this new this new world order that we find ourselves in and so um i think that uh, for us, it's uh, as a creative myself who's never had to to think of these kind of forms of output before. These platforms as necessarily where things will be maybe the main, maybe the principal platform in which they're they're consumed. Um, to begin to, to to consider that, and um, 
yeah, it's uh, it's 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 time for lemonade. We I uh, think surrounded, by lem- surrounded by lemons. Yeah, Eric, that's a great point you're making because I really see that happening on on a lot of international platforms now too. Is the uh, the change of aesthetics, like what used to be called what was what is good, you know, like who decides what good is? And I think it's a really nice point that you're making with regards to the aesthetics of theater or of. Uh, it's changing now because of the media that we're using and what used to be called now that's too amateurish or something like that is now considered all of a sudden totally cool. And I think that's a really good thing that we are switching what is good and what is not good. And there is no not good. Everything is good. You know, like that kind of thing is really interesting to, to have that conversation. And, and another thing is, we, I mean, when I say we, I mean, uh, I, I kind of get that I'm no longer part of the younger generation. Uh, we might have been used more to um, looking at things live. Uh, and therefore, we might have a certain sense of like, ooh, but the online and that's not. But our children, this is what they're used to. They, they are used to, uh, to consume theater and arts and maybe not necessarily live theater, obviously, but to, they are used to consume arts in a different way than we when we grew up. And so I think it's very important to think about that too, is uh, it's not indeed what Eric is saying. It's not about because we now have to. It's also, it's the pandemic has accelerated something that in a way already was happening. Let's face it, the performing arts were in crisis in in many parts of the world before. Things needed to change. And particularly young theater makers were already pushing, were already going in different directions. And I think in a way it's super exciting that the pandemic now has kind of accelerated that. So I just wanna, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say Eric is making a really interesting point there that I feel is is really good to take into consideration. Thank you all. Speaking from Erin and Eric, uh, technology is an open opportunity for us to tap into the young audiences and to start building the young audiences that we've been neglecting. It's also an opportunity for us to open our wardrobes and get the old things that we have been neglecting. Um, I'm going to the third question, which is, or part of it has already been answered in the uh, conversations that we've been having, which is about uh, the different platforms across collaborating across the continent. What what has been your your experience? Do you think it's of value, and how can it be effective? Bearing in mind the language divide that exists across the regions of this continent. And uh, in this era where we are looking at opportunities of scaling up, how can we maximize that opportunity to collaborate with other people? I'll direct the questions to Nick and Ed, Edwin to start with that. Okay, um, a big question, I'll try and answer it in, um, in parts. I think, I think what's really been nice is that people are taking risks. Things that they wouldn't have done because of the aesthetic, some of the points that Eric made and Erwin made earlier, people are saying, let's just give it a go and we'll see how we go. And they tend to ask the audiences and the participants for generosity and say, look, someone might fall off the internet or something might go wrong, we just kind of stick with us. And what you're seeing is you're seeing a lot more interesting cross-sector collaborations. You're seeing a lot of people from outside of the art sector coming into the arts because they need a new way of working or new way of making or producing their events because the default to some of these corporate companies and the bigger institutions is to try and replicate what we've always done but do it online. And they realize that those part, those um, events and activities don't tend to be successful because we are online and it's different. It's not even that we're online, it's we're online in the context of almost being in, in well, for many of us, we in England, a forced lockdown. We're at lockdown until I think next week. 
and um and there's so many restrictions as to what you can and can't do who you can and can't see and i think one of the areas that is really picking up speed in england is the gaming areas is the gaming platforms and we are seeing that a little bit sort of within platforms like airme where they have this sort of interactivity and these immersive feel to it but also ar and vr you know um augmented reality and um, reality and uh, virtual reality are beginning to play a really interesting role with data makers and it was always something that was i mean here in england that was a little slow but you can see people are really running with it and exploring it a lot more and i think we shouldn't ignore what the gaming space has been doing i mean if you think about gaming it's storytelling, it's visual arts, it's music, it's drama, it's all of these things that we're doing, um, but in within this virtual space that has been cutting across boundaries. And I think lots of, even with the COVID communications, they've been working with the gaming platforms here in England. And there's one big organization over here that has been working with the comms, um, fake news that we, we've been getting around COVID and in building some of that into the gaming and thinking about how gaming can help communicate these key messages that, are, that have been getting lost in the, in the, in the sea of fake news. So I, I, I think, um, I, I think it's, um, it's a really exciting time. And I think what also I've seen is a lot of international platforms are reaching out beyond their usual network um, and saying, come and engage with us. It's free to participate. So some of the big platforms like ISPA and the Performing Arts, uh, um, the Professional Association of Canadian Theatres, they're allowing people to come into their platform for free. And normally you would have to pay quite a large fee. And it's just another way for people to start to connect and see what's going on in a space that they wouldn't have normally had access to. So this is this is my thoughts around this. I'm answering as many of the points as I can remember around Rosetta. But Owen, do you want to add anything else? No, you're just very briefly, I think you, you're, I like actually that you're not only talking about platforms, you know, in the way like we are, for example, collaborating with MBO MTI, but that we're also looking at different interdisciplinary platforms, how we are indeed now working with the gaming industry. Um, and I do think, uh, I think particularly what we're missing in live performing arts is not so much what was on the stage, because what was on the stage, we can still see or hear or you know online it is more that the art of gathering this bringing together this being together as people i think that is something that we're trying to figure out how can we do that in a virtual sense and i mean i was really struck by when it when the pandemic was really bad here in new york uh, in the spring when there were more than a thousand people dying every day uh, we were not allowed to have funerals and so people were starting to have funerals in like the gaming in, in like in Fortnite, like because that was a, a space where they could gather as uh, avatars, but still had the feeling that they were somehow together or connected. It was really quite remarkable. And the other thing that I would say is, uh, you know, in all ancient narratives, pandemics were never the end of the story. They were always the start of the story. And so I feel like in a way, uh yeah it's we should look at it as a portal to you know what is what is what can what new world can we create out of this there's so much that is being changing and that's so much that's being destroyed in a way but that also allows for new things to happen and i think that's uh, very exciting uh and and some of these exchanges that are happening and one of the one of the examples is our exchanges pace with nbo mti uh, similarly with the lagos fringe festival in lagos with decaf in uh in morocco so uh so yeah so there's a lot of exciting collaborations happening and maybe that's happening now more or faster because of the virtual space uh because now people might just think of it quicker 
because before they might have to think, oh, we have to find funding to fly to, you know, and now we just say, uh, it doesn't matter if I collaborate with somebody across the street or across the world. It's the same thing. We have to meet on Zoom anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so collaborate, um, Eric and Shiba, um, have you had experience of collaborating beyond the arts ecosystem um, outside the art to facilitate the works that you're doing? And um, I would like uh, you to give uh, your experiences in how you've been able to uh, produce your works in different parts of the regions, bearing in mind that there's a language barrier. How have you been able to break down that language barrier in the different platforms that you are sharing your works? It's a producing question, Shiba, you better take it. Is it a producer question? Oh. I was yeah, like, definitely. I'm probably the last example of this <laughs> of collaboration outside our spaces. And maybe um, instead of uh, pointing you to specific examples, I mean, in a, in, in a small and more immediate sense, I can say that, you know, our experience with, uh, Kamp with the Kampala Festival was very, very useful in terms of beginning to unlock what it is to, to produce with another body in the, in the region. We had a lot of um, collaboration about bringing our four works in progress to Kampala Festival, and that needed to be a very close and um, very partnership to, to, to basically get the courage to decide to do that. And it was profoundly um, affecting, I said, as I said, for all of us, in terms of making that space between our countries much, much shorter. So I would say the first step is to just try it first, <laughs> just give it a go. Um, there are not that many tried and tested paths along which we can, we can um, already uh, speak to other people's experiences. And sometimes you may be the very first person um, attempting to do that particular version of thing, or, 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 at, or at least if there were others before you, they haven't left enough um, breadcrumbs or stones on the path for you to follow. So there is also a real importance for us as we do these collaborations to also document um, what we're doing as, as we go along. Um, but out of that participation in PACE, we were immediately able to start to work with um, uh, directors, directors from the region. Uh, for instance, uh, we started to work with um, Arthur on one of, to come in and, and be a consultant on one of the projects that is a multilingual piece that also needed a certain, um, a certain uh, dramaturgy that comes from this region in order to um, ensure that it's like really being true to the story that it's trying to tell both in its storytelling and its music. And sometimes, you know, just being able to have a bigger resource pool of, of, of uh, professionals to, to draw from, you're able to get like, you know, some, some expertise that you maybe weren't aware of, we, we, maybe wasn't available in your immediate local environment, but once you expand the parameters a bit, you already, um, have access to other people, you have access to the right people. I think for me, what I most find uh, challenging about this question is, well, I'm interrogating myself as a producer who's, I would say, you know, reasonably successfully produced in, in this country. Why have there been such substantial barriers to creating the pathways to producing the work or traveling the work around the region and the continent? and I notably was comparing it to, you know, in my growing up years, the National Theatre was regularly visited by productions from Uganda, from Tanzania, from Rwanda, um, and there was a real intention. I mean, there, were, there, were, there, was, there was a very, well, here we go. It was a very Pan-African season, right? Um, and it began to strike me that there being no normal, like very clear established like commercial paths or like commercial like precedents that say do this, it's going to be, it's going to work out. And so all these ventures sometimes somehow being high risk um, events, there has to be something else that drives it. And perhaps that thing has to be ideological. It has to be something else beyond just like, will I be able to you know, show my work to that audience and be usefully compensated for that. 
it is a high risk thing to ask yourself if you take your work to Niamey, as Eric was saying, whether you're going to find the right audience, you're going to find the right partners, are, are your people going to be say, are you going to be left stranded at the hotel with no, uh, without the guy having paid the, you know, <laughs> who was supposed to be hosting you having paid? I, there's a vulnerability and a risk that comes with that work that can only be overridden by a decision that like is, is um, that transcends what the risks that are presented. And for me, and for me, that is about making a dramatic and, and market ideological shift to say that this is something we collectively desire. We have to de decide continentally that we collectively desire to see works from the rest of the continent. It's not going to do it to itself in the short term. If we want to see it in the shorter term, a different set of intentions has to be set. I think also just just uh, briefly um, in in creating work that has that will that that cuts across sort of language barriers. Very often, um, I don't know whether that's the, this is the experience everywhere, but I know in Kenya, for instance, when you were um, you'll find that uh, as, as tends to happen, um, uh, an actor or a communicator will be much more um, adept at communicating in, in one language than, than than he or she is in in, in another, right? And so I think that going forward, um, uh, like I know, for example, um, I, 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 can, I can deliver a lecture in English, right? But try and get me to do the same thing in Kiswahili, that's not going to happen with the same degree of fluency, right? And same degree of comfort. Um, and it's also see with actors on stage, you know, you give them a line to speak and it, it might come out quite stilted unless they, they, they get to speak it in the way and the form and the language in which they are used, you know? Um, and so going forward, even sort of uh, cultural barriers where language is concerned, I know uh, for a while it had been, oh, subtitles, super titles are never going to work on theater or they work so badly or whatever. But it's like we've been hopping on about uh, on and on in this conversation. It's, it's new parameters, new rules, right? And so whether it's that everyone is getting the, the script as a PDF on their phone and they're reading it in the audience and sort of following along, you know, it's this whole whatever, you know, um, but, and, and maybe even actors delivering lines in different languages. I mean, um, it's always a shock to me to, to uh, show up in Johannesburg and people are speaking any one of 11 languages to each other in the streets. And they're like, I didn't know you speak Kosa. No, I don't speak Kosa, I speak Zulu, but that guy understood me because we have this relationship, you know, we understand each other. And they're like, wow, this is like, it, it's, it's, it's what the world needs. Let's just, yeah, this, uh, we, just, we just have to learn each other's languages. Uh, um, and also, um, yeah, to put, put all that stuff on stage and uh, uh, if, if we ever do get back on stage. But I mean, directorially, uh, even a director is going to know how to, to get a, a character to say a line in a way that we understand what's being said. We just saw this wonderful production in, in, um, in Kampala at, at uh, KITF where um, this, this the woman from the Middle East, um, or from, was she from North Africa? You have to remind me. Um, the one about the woman about the, the play about- Last the, Day of she Spring. Lost brother. Exactly, you know? Um, and whoa, that was, we got into that all the way, you know? Um, it was subtitles, you know? And uh, uh, just, just, in, just having her say, go through her lines and everything just in Arabic and, us hearing this wonderful language just flow over us in the audience and we're just completely bathed in this thing, you know? And yeah, fine, we're reading the subtitles, but it was a completely immersive experience. So language is, language is not an issue. I said I'd be brief and I completely lied, but I'm done. Just to add to your point, so I just love what South Africans do. They, you can watch a TV. I, I kind of got to know a little bit through the um, soap operas where they were just, everyone was going in and out at least two or three languages and they just subtitled. So you get used to doing that. But Owen did a great piece a couple of years ago where he was working in, was it Corsa and Afrikaans and English? Three languages? Uh, I mean, the last piece that we did was Corsa, Zulu, Afrikaans, English and Mandarin, because actually uh, there's a huge uh, Chinese, Taiwanese Chinese population in Bloemfontein. So I, compl I couldn't agree more, Eric. I think listening, already hearing a different language already puts you in a different perspective. 
uh, as an audience member. I mean, I come from a country, for, in Holland, it's obligatory to speak four languages because, you know, nobody speaks Dutch. We're so tiny. So uh, we are surrounded by all these bigger nations around us. So we have to learn their languages. But, uh, but I think there is something to it. To hear other languages is, is incredibly powerful. And uh, that's what I like indeed in South Africa too. I, when Ricardo asked me to make work there, um, due to the history of South Africa that you still see in the theater world, it's still quite segregated, the English language theater versus the Afrikaans language theater versus you know, the, the African languages uh, theater separate. It's quite separated. And that was definitely, as a theater maker, I said, I do not want to make any work here that would follow that silo. Uh, so I said, I only, if you want me to make work here, it's going to be multilingual because this country is multilingual. So we need to represent that on stage. Uh, I'm always a big, uh, proponent of representation on stage of the society that you make your work in. So I think, yeah, multi-language, I'm all for it. And indeed, uh, uh, translations. It's so funny that uh, in the most, in the, in the kind of like most posh and oldest uh, uh, the theater uh, medium opera, it's so normal to have subtitles. There. Everybody finds it normal to have subtitles in the opera. And it's the most posh, most oldest, you know, like uh, medium in theater. So why are we not doing it in the most contemporary theater? Uh, we can totally use it. So um, I, we're going to go to the second last question, which uh, is most creative platforms on the continent get their funding elsewhere mainly from Europe and North America. Some of the funding comes with an agenda attached to it. Is it really possible for African creative platforms to truly be disruptive as desired, to manage their activities as desired, and to be innovative in the way they do their work? If is the funder in the most cases dictates the agenda? How have you been able to create and innovate in your organizations? And how do you finance your activities? I will start with Eric and, and Shiba. I think I'll, 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 even, I'll, I'll even jump in straight. Um, in our experience, sometimes the funders have, have had an agenda. Yes, yes, yes. But in Kenya, our main sensor has been the government. You know, um, it's uh, it's uh, it, in no way are we gonna say, oh, um, we got we got this money from Diffid or whatever, whatever. And they had an agenda. No, it has been the Ken the Kenyan government stifling us at every possible opportunity. You know, um, uh, uh, you 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 take a stand against the government, and suddenly if you're invited to play a gig and the president's gonna be there, you're literally cancelled. You know, <laughs> on the day of. You know. Um, it's and so I, for me the problem has never been the agenda of the of, of the funder. You know, it's the it's the despots and the tyrants and the I'm gonna save the expletives for another conversation. <laughs> who they are currently living under? You know, I mean in Uganda right now. I mean, um, look uh, with, with, with what's what's happening um, with dear Roberts. You know, being uh, being arrested. Um, why am I forgetting his name? Bobby Wine. I'm, I'm only remembering. Yeah, Bobby Wine. Um, uh, it's 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 ridiculous. That I mean, um, you know, uh, when 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 if 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 the artists are free, then then the, then the people are free. You know. Uh, and governments know that, um, and it's 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 been our it's been our battle in Kenya, as in uh, even right now we're fighting the censorship of uh, of um, of some of the new music coming out of 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 sort of let me say of of the parts of the city that that are sort of you know it's like like inner city as it were you know 
and uh, it, and the lyrics are lurid, and it's just it's, uh, it's 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 very overtly sexual stuff, right? And the censorship board is like, oh no, they can't do this, they can't do this, they can't do this. But we're saying, look, let these twenty-year-olds say what they want to say about about their lives because um, they are taking a particular stand about how they see this world. And of course, it comes with a certain degree of, of res responsibility, that freedom, yes. But who are, who, who are the censorship board to tell them what to say and what to write when, I mean, you're a pastor condemning them. And, but when a corrupt politician walks into your church, you let them sit in the front row, right? And so the kids are saying, we don't care what you have to say, you know? And so um, I think that uh, we, we need an end and this will, this will continue. Uh, we've talked about technology over and over again. I mean, at one point, uh, many years ago, and I was singing this song, that um, an anti-corruption song, and the government officials there tried to stop me singing it. Um, the song had already been playing on radio, and so the audience started to sing along with it, even when they were trying to switch us off, right? And here we are right now, um, you can literally, I can literally come up with a song in the next five minutes and have it on WhatsApp, have it on, on Instagram, have it everywhere, right? And so there is ways of us disseminating our, our our thoughts and feelings and um, our our artwork um, that 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 will bypass all the all the hurdles that have been put in front of us, be they um, uh, of our government's own making of our, us maybe even self censoring or and unlikely so um, uh, an agenda coming from from uh, from a foreign donor. Well, tell us how you really feel about our government, Eric. <laughs> Don't hold back or worry about us getting in trouble or anything. <laughs> I guess that cancels us getting money from the Ministry of uh, Culture this uh, for the end of the year. Thanks. No, um, I, I, <laughs> I. I absolutely, I mean, I really understand where the spirit of this question is coming from in a, in a sort of different way. I don't see it so much, I suppose what I'm understanding from the question is not so much the overt requirement that you do or don't speak to certain issues if you're going to take this money, but rather the skewing that takes place when there's resources that are available for certain kinds of work and not for others and uh, for work that and typically, I think, I suppose what has happened in this in this space is that because we receive a lot of donor aid, um, things that are aligned with the particular donor agenda items, it's water, it's AIDS, it's healthcare, it's, you know, important, worthy things, democratization, like what the new wave is of what... Um, the donor investment in that region as part of like the development aid, you know, relationship with the country, what that looks like will start to, to flavor the tastes of your plays, possibly. Yes, it will, of course it will. Like the, the reason that they enter into those partnerships um, with creative people is because they recognize the transformative uh, effects that like, all of the arts have in, in you know, ad advancing a particular social change um, agenda. I think that the difficulty is that there isn't enough other funding that is like, you know, more independent, less strings attached, less um, tied to a particular communication point. And I think that is a real dilemma. It's one of the reasons why we have to always keep advocating for um, more of the resources that are like uh, apportioned by the state to go into helping to uh, pr producers and production companies to have some kind of a creative and under uh, some kind of an underpinning that also um, uh, doesn't limit people's creativity but allows there to be openly produced work. But it is, for instance, the reason why I stepped away from working within um, the uh, not for profit and donor funded sector, um, you know, maybe 10 years ago and took a decision to work more intensely in the um, commercial sector because there is a freedom that comes from that, from negotiating your, your relationship directly with your audience. 
you know, I mean, ticketing is the first form of crowdsourcing. I'm like, crowdsourcing, that's just selling tickets, you know? It's that, it's like, um, and ticketing platforms that have come up in Kenya have allowed us to now, you know, put, you know, sell your tickets months in advance and be able to at least um, underwrite the, your, your early production costs, to have good production, projections about um, what you're going to be able to make on that production, to invite um, sponsorship based on the size of what you think your audience is going to do, and also be able to offer a stronger value proposition to other people that want to partner with you, even those not for like, you know, not for profit agenda driven um, partners. Um, it, I just feel like be having a really rigorous um, close attachment to your audience base and the recognition of the value that they hold your work in is, is, is critical to negotiating freedom away from um, uh, having your work predetermined by, the, the, your, by your funding source. Um, a great initiative that's happening with one of the ticketing platforms in Kenya called uh, <sighs> My goodness, why have I forgotten their name, Eric? Not to, also Ticket Sasa, but the other, our friend. MOOC, sorry. <laughs> MOOC, which is a ticketing platform that came up uh, a few years ago. They are now, if you've been ticketing through their platform, which I do exclusive, which we I've been doing exclusively on some of my projects for some years, they are now, um, they've entered into a relationship with a banking facility that based on your track record, this begins to count as credit to you that on a particular production, they'll be willing to advance you a certain amount of, of, um, of money that can go into your early production costs, which is it's quite a big thing in a country where you can't get credit for, um, for creative productions um, whatsoever. It's, an, it's using your ticketing track record as your credit report, as it were. Um, I, 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 I think that we have to really look carefully at what, um, about uh, at building, especially for smaller arts organizations, about building very secure, much more secure. Not if you if more than half of your funding is entirely from uh, donor agencies or from not for profit agency support, you are in a vulnerable position. Things will change. Organizations across Kenya collapsed when Ford Foundation decided to wrap up its um, arts funding program and switch to um, funding media. Um, and tragically, many arts organizations just couldn't couldn't sustain them, couldn't weather that very rough transition. Um, and so, yeah, that's I, I think a diversity of like your income sources is so so critical, and spending a lot of energy and a lot of resource in building a sub, a subscriber base to your work um, of it just allows you to diversify. Um, the, it, it allows you a surer footing, more security, and um, makes it easy. Makes it yeah easier for you to be in charge of the output of your content. Of your of your content. Sorry. Thank you, Eric and Sheba. To Nick and uh, Erwin. Um, how have you been able to finance your activities? And yeah, how have you been able to finance your activities? Yeah, I think for Pace, I mean, it's what Shiba was saying is, is been, we've been lucky to really uh, tap into various different uh, uh, funding uh, sources, um, relatively small, all, but they all kind of like take, do a part of the programming. Um, it's been my experience, actually, that uh, interestingly, the the funding sources or that we were in communication with on the continent seem to have more of an agenda than the ones outside of the continent. That was our experience. Um, obviously, we are not creating work, so we are not so much um, uh, as pace. We're not developing the work ourselves, uh, so there might not be so much this focus on censorship of, of, of specific work, but uh, we of course are focusing on trying to get artists from different areas uh, to come. And then you obviously are fa faced with uh, national uh, funding sources that only fund their artists. And, and that's kind of natural, but it becomes a problem if they are saying which artists 
we should invite or not. And that is something that PACE has always been very, very independent in. We do not take any funding if it comes with that kind of um, uh, agenda where we don't have the liberty to choose which artists are selected for the for the Pan-African Creative Exchange. So again, we have a selection committee that is uh, of about eight, seven people uh, from different festivals. And if then, if we do get some people from Nigeria, for example, but the Nigerian government wants to fund, but say, yeah, but you can't take those artists, then we don't take that funding because we will still decide to take those artists. Uh, so we are able to get some funding sources from, from elsewhere. Um, I think indeed the tricky thing with arts period uh, is that uh, there seems to be good art sources for specific uh, programming um, uh, elements. But when it comes to operational costs, which everybody always has, that's the problem where you can't find funding for, uh, is to actually pay you know, for your phone lines or for uh, the paper that you need to, you know, like those kind of costs seems to be uh, uh, tricky to find funding for. But um, yeah, we, we are really fortunate to have uh, some funding sources that were able to, to keep us up um, and to make sure that we can uh, pay for the artists uh, at least some small stipend. I think another thing is to be very aware of is to build relationships with your funders. A lot of people tend to apply for funders and then forget to invite them to the premiere or forget to invite them for the event. Um, but the relationship that you build with funders is incredibly important uh, and these conversations to have with them. Uh, I remember for us, like Nikkei said, uh, we were able to, to switch some of our funding sources that were supposed to be for tickets, for flights. Um, and then when all of a sudden the pandemic hit and we went virtual, um, we obviously didn't need flights. And so they were about to retract their offer, but then we came back to them and said, hey, it's a mobility fund. Uh, why not look at mobility, at digital mobility, having artists access uh, the digital space? Uh, it's not a ticket, it's not a flight ticket, but it's a voucher for internet. And so they actually really like that. And this is something that we need to think about. We are the creatives in the room. Many of the funders are not the creatives. We are the creatives in the room. So we need to come up with the solutions. Maybe we need to say it in a way that they think that they came up with it. But if you are good at that, then they really, really go for it. So be creative also in that sense, you know? And that's what I'm saying, like, build the relationship with your funders because it's really important to have those relationships. I just wanted to say for the people that, were at, that are on the Zoom with us, um, we actually posted some things in the chat of, of different funding sources and mobility sources or, or not even necessarily funds, but also just guides for more information. So you can access that there. And I also know that uh, Karishma uh, posted a, a Google Doc with many more platforms on the continent that we as PACE have relationships with, but also that we're looking to build as a, as a document. Uh, of, of platforms on the continent. So for those that are with us on Zoom, you can access that there uh, as well. Um, um, Sheba, I, would, I have a, uh, what advice would you give someone who wants to move from nonprofit to commercial? Uh, where would they begin from? What would you tell them? What would you advise them to do? Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I say, I say it like it's an easy thing. Of course, it's like, <laughs> it's, you see, now you've caught me out. It's hard work, girl. It's hard work. And to be totally, I mean, I, I you know, to take, actually, I was just thinking that, of course, this is very contextual to what kind of work we're doing. So to be fair um, and to be clear, say for instance, with the um, NBO MTI, which is a not-for-profit initiative that is cultivating um, creative people, developing their work and doesn't have an immediate like commercial output, mm -hmm. that you know, what are you, that you have no real choices except to look for arts funding from arts funding sources and from uh, possible benefactors and from possible um, 
the sponsors who see you as part of like their social responsibility work. Um, when I talk about uh, making that transition into like, you know, if you're, if you're doing stage plays, for instance, I think the biggest mistake that certainly for me, the big transition moment between beginning to ch differentiating between my work, being able to exist in a commercial environment in Kenya and to create a commercial environment around our productions in Kenya came from visit, we went to visit a, a theater in, 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 in London and we were talking about taking Eric's play to the Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh Festival. Um, and uh, the, this was the Pleasance Theater. And we, I sat down with the director of it then and he, put, he showed me how he does his budgets, you know. And it's so interesting that that could be such a transformative moment in somebody's life. But, you know, he, I remember him show, we, so Kenya up until that point had been doing three, you do a weekend, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and that's it. So you'd have four, four plays, you know, or, or you'd, you'd show your play four times, at most you'd do it eight times, you know. And you can see that there's no way there's going to be like any kind of a commercial proposition around that. I don't know why we had a kind of, fully realize that. I think we just accepted that this is how we found it and this is therefore how you do it. So uh, being in the theater will always be something that you're doing on the side and you know in your nights and weekends and never something that's in your main, main time of day. The big transformation was actually beginning to think of a play as like something that you could run for months and to accept that like you were going to have uh, sometimes when you have a lot, like a huge number of ticket sales um, somewhere towards the end and almost zero ticket sales somewhere towards the beginning and beginning to work with the idea of long runs with an amortization of like what your expectation is. So instead of having eight shows that you're like, we must desperately all sell them out, you're talking about having 30 or 40 or 50 shows um, where you can do a minimum guarantee of 30% across the board and then you begin to, it won't work for every play, not every play will have that capacity, but um, there's a lot of plays that will be able to do this. And so I think I would say the first step is to begin to look at taking the production that you have and what the production costs are of that production and looking at how long it would take you at a fairly conservative ticketing rate to break even on that as your baseline for whether you can do this or not. What that baseline number is, you make sure that you make the play that you can afford to make then. You know, you don't go too far outside of this and be like, oh, I'm gonna do, you know, 30 iterations of this play and each of them is gonna sell out. They're not, they're just not gonna do that. So you work on a less, uh, you know, on an average that's far below the number and you look at what that potential income would be and you make the play that you can afford for that, that budget. And then you may be pleasantly surprised and sell 50% of your, your, your ticketing across the board. I mean, you'll of course have to augment this with like sponsorships and, and other partnerships potentially to get to your targeted budget. But immediately you start to, talk about running your production for a longer time, you become a more interesting proposition to anybody whose partnership you are seeking. Whether it's like vendors who are having space at your event to, you know, to, to, to do uh, addition, who want vending space at your, at, your, at your run, or whether it's commercial sponsors who are supporting your production because you're communicating for much longer, you're really changing the proposition of what's interesting to them. You're moving from, 800 people seeing your play on two weekends to potentially like, you know, 10,000 people, which certainly makes for a critical mass that is more interesting for them as, an, as, a, um, as a marketing uh, body or um, so as a marketing department of, of, a, of, a, of a commercial entity. I think it's a gradual process and I think you have to do small experiments and I think it's good to seek out mentorship from people who've done that path before. And I'm really happy to look at anybody's, uh, you know, your budgets or your plans and, and say to you, well, this is how I would do it if I was doing it. Thank you very much, Sheba. Um, to anyone who's looking to move from nonprofit to commercial, Sheba has offered 
surfaces of consultation and advice. And thank you very much, Ewen, for... Somebody who does not have all the answers. So. You do not have all the answers, but you can always help someone move into that direction. I, Your experience right. is worth so much for so many people who have never done it. Uh, Ewen, thank you very much for telling us that we have to be creative with our finances and find ways to speak to the funder or the people around us. As we're wrapping up, because the time is fast spent, I will ask uh, each of the platforms to tell us how we can follow your platforms and how we can learn more about the work you're doing and how people can reach you. I will start with Eric and Sheba. Can you hear me now? Yes, Sheba, you wanna take this? You are muted. Karishma has very like very sweetly put all the actual information inside there. That's nbomti.org is our website. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram at, at NBO Musical Theatre Initiative on Instagram, nbomti on Twitter, and the, that's our that's ours. I was about to read um, paces. Um, but you can also reach us through, um, I think we can drop our contact. I can, I will drop my email address is sheba.hurst at gmail. And I can be reached on that. And, and um, I think it really is an interesting season for collaborations that uh, I th this is just a, a wrapping up thought, which is that I, th I think a lot of these collaborations are going to become, uh, have to be built around individual people building relationships with each other and finding one ally, just one person, you, know, you kind of think of this great scoping things, but it's, I think really the, the work begins to move because uh, a, you know, Sheba connects with, um, uh, Rosetta, and we decide like, hey, what's a work that would work in Kenya and in Uganda? And maybe we put together a joint cast and we begin to make work that we know will resonate in both of our contexts and then travel it to each other and begin to see what that process looks like. Um, I definitely think um, this is the kind of work that will be, will be realized by making with many mistakes along the way. And um, yeah, we, we've just got to dive in and, and get going. Nika, you wanna you wanna go? <laughs> how we, how people can connect with us? Um, the website um, Pan African Grid Exchange is uh, um, can you put it in the chat? Also, all the um, social media um, handles and stuff are on the on the website. Um, I'll put my email address in, though I'm not the easiest person to get hold of because I'm always super busy. So it's better to go to our info because there's someone that manages that inbox. Um, and we will be most probably looking to open calls um, for our platform, most probably mid next year. So maybe around September-ish next year, perhaps, we will we'll make sure that um, Cuba and Gridfer and um, Rosette get the um, information so they can disseminate it because we need to have more Kenyan representation. We will get to get that and any other activity out to you. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, now the uh, I think the the, the platform that uh, or the document that Karishma sent uh, has really all the, the the details in there, uh, and I'm uh, I I was told that she's also gonna. Uh, disseminate it uh, among all the people that uh, that have uh, that are with us um, so you can find all our details there and uh, and uh, there's so many other platforms too I just want to reiterate what Shiba said I think the 
the ma it starts with the collaboration between artists themselves. Uh, don't wait for presenters or for producers or uh, because then you can really wait for a long time. It's really about the collaboration between the artists that makes that makes stuff happen. Uh, and I think that's particularly with regard to international work, which is really something that Pace is standing for, of course, is the exchange of the work. Uh, I, I always see that the biggest strength and power comes from the artists connecting with each other uh, instead of artists connecting to a presenter or to a producer, but it's actually the artists together that makes a lot happen. I'd uh, like to take this opportunity to thank the panelists for this rich discussion. Uh, our time has been far spent and I don't seem to see any questions arising. If there's anyone who has questions, I haven't seen any questions in the chat. I've not seen someone who's raising any questions. Uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity and for sharing the knowledge that you've shared with us. Um, at this, on this note, I would like to hand over to Karishma, who has asked me to close, to take over. Thank you so much, Rosette. Uh, thank you to our panelists again, just reiterating how inspiring and uh, wonderful this conversation was. So really, really appreciate you spending time speaking with us. Uh, thank you to our wonderful Ros uh, moderator, Rosette, for leading us through this conversation um, and to all of our viewers, both on our Zoom platform and uh, on Facebook and in any other way that you may have been connected. Um, of course, feel free to reach out to us if you do have follow-up questions through our Facebook pages. We'll be happy to find a way to connect you to our panelists if they are specific questions. But of course, if it's to do with KITF, uh, reach out to us over on our social media um, via email and we'll get back to you, you as soon as possible. And we hope that we'll be able to connect with you all tomorrow at um, 4 p.m. East Africa time for the KITF cocktail and mingling. And of course, the KITF through the years documentary will be released on our YouTube channel at exactly 2 p.m. East Africa time for you to watch in advance of the cocktail hour or whenever convenient. So thank you all so much. I'm going to end the live stream now. Thanks, folks. <laughs>